Good morning, church. I'm Grove Church's Pastor Gary Nara, and welcome to worship. We are in the middle of a sermon series about uh, the first families in the book of Genesis and what they teach us about our families. Today, the focus is on setting healthy boundaries to be emotionally and spiritually sound families of goodness and health and peace. Let's take this time to quietly prepare our souls for worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into, Come into God's, God's presence, presence with, with singing. singing. Let us pray together. As the sun rises each morning, so does our prayer, loving God. With each new dawn, renew our trust in you, our delight to serve you, and our gladness to be in your presence. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Our Old Testament lesson today is from Genesis 13, verses 1 through 12. So Abram went up to Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him, into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. He journeyed on by stages from the Negev as far as Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them living together, for their possessions were so great that they could not live together. And there was strife between the herders of Abram's livestock and the herders of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites lived in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herders and my herders, for we are kindred. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. Lot looked about him and saw that the plain of the Jordan was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. This was before the plain of the Jordan. No, this was before the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the plain of the Jordan and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan while Lot settled in the cities among the plain and moved his tent as far as Sodom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Grove Church, and good morning, children of God. I will be playing the part of Eva today, so if you don't like any of the jokes that are in here, please blame her, not me. Today, we're talking about two guys from way back in the Old Testament. But before we get to the lesson, I have a joke for you. Why did the lobster lose all of his friends? I need a rim shot for her. Because he was shellfish. Get it? Shellfish kind of sounds like selfish. All right, groan, groan. That's what our lesson is about today. A guy who was selfish. The guy who had a nephew named Lot. They were traveling together to find a new land to call their own. As you heard Mrs. Traber read to us. But both men couldn't live on the same land 
So one of them was going to have to keep traveling to find another spot. Now, Abraham was unselfish, and he gave Lot the first choice of land. Wasn't that nice? Think about when you're at recess and you're picking teams for dodgeball. You want the first choice, right? You want to grab the best player first? And that's what Lot did. He chose the best spot. Lot chose the land that was perfectly green and beautiful. But this choice was also a dangerous one because it meant living near a place known for doing naughty things. Lot learned a hard lesson in this story, and we can learn from it too. You see, Lot thought that choosing the best spot meant only good things would happen to him. But this spot was close to a wicked city named Sodom. It was famous for naughty people who did things that didn't honor God. Lot didn't care. He wanted the land, and that's all he cared about. That's what selfishness does to us. When we want something, we don't care what it costs. Go back to dodgeball at recess. If all you care about is getting the first pick, you might really hurt other kids' feelings. But Lot's not the only one who learned a lesson here in this story. Here's what Abraham learned. Because Abraham gave Lot the first choice, God blessed Abraham's unselfishness by giving him even better land. When we choose to be unselfish, God finds a way to reward that because God wants us to be unselfish. God wants us to serve others bef before ourselves. And that's what Abraham did, and he was blessed for it. Abraham goes on to be one of the most famous people in the Bible, known for his great faith and love for God. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this story from the Bible that reminds us to be unselfish and think about the needs of others so that we can please you and be blessed by our kindness. Amen. Uh From Paul's first letter to his young friend, Timothy, beginning at chapter 3, verse 1, the word that is translated bishop is really better translated overseer. And so as a bishop is an overseer of a much larger flock, at least nowadays, not necessarily so in these times, so a pastor is also an overseer of a flock. So when you hear the word bishop, you can always substitute the word overseer or more commonly for us, pastor. The saying is sure. Whoever aspires to the office of bishop desires a noble task. Now, a bishop must be above reproach, married only once, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, an apt teacher, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace and the snare of the devil. Deacons, likewise, must be serious, not double-tongued, not indulging in much wine, not greedy for money. They must hold fast to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them first be tested. Then, if they prove themselves blameless, let them serve as deacons. Women deacons, likewise, must be serious, not slanderers, but temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be married only once and let them manage their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and great boldness in the faith that is Christ Jesus. The word of God for us, thanks be to God. The Bible's family, the church family, families in general, they are stories from Genesis that are less familiar 
or are familiar but presented in ways that draw some different conclusions than one customarily hears. I believe that where there is emotional and spiritual health, goodness, and peace in our personal and family lives, it's easier to bring health, goodness, and peace to our community and world. As the hymn announces, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. We're called to this, yet we can only give what we have. Today, then, I want to talk about Abram's family, my family, and the ministry of a local church pastor. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, may the words that come from my mouth and the words that are heard by our ears be your word for our lives. We pray in your holy name. Amen. So many of us know the stories featuring Abraham, Sodom and Gomorrah, Isaac's birth to aged parents, and Isaac's near sacrifice at the hand of his father, Abraham. But in a less familiar story, at the start of this saga, Abram, his wife, Sari, and their nephew, Lot, set out from Ur, and you can see the map there. Ur is down on the uh, bottom. There on the, the, the southeast, Abram and the family go from Ur, head up northwest to Haran. That's the ancient name, and it's still the name of the town in northern Syria, um, borders Turkey. Turkey, by the way, now has a new name. It's, it's uh, Turkey. Moving southwest to Bethel. Bethel is not on the map then to Egypt on the far left of the map, and then back to Canaan. Canaan was the ancient name for Israel. It's this last move to Canaan that is today's setting. Now, Abram and Lot were both wealthy sheiks. You know, you've heard of Arab sheiks. That's, that's really what they were. Their wealth is of such magnitude that the large tracts of land which they inhabit cannot sustain them and their livestock. Finding adequate resources then becomes a divisive issue for the shepherds and other herdsmen charged with overseeing their flocks and herds. Now, Abraham and Lot value family so highly that they are unwilling to let anything or anyone damage that fealty. Good for them, because there is potential here for their property caretakers and managers to negatively impact the relationship which their families have with one another. Now, the shepherds and herdsmen, loyal, competent, beloved employees, do not maliciously set out to drive a wedge between Lot and Abram. They simply want to do their job well, and they can't because of the constrained space and the limited natural resources. Inadvertently, then, their legitimate concerns run the risk of creating competition and distress among their employers and families. Lot and Abram then decide to establish 
a physical distance between themselves so not to create any damaging emotional distance between them. Very wise. They say, hey, if there's not enough room, one of us will move and make room. Those new boundaries will serve us well, and they will preserve the best about us and our relationship. Two thumbs up. Do we let others get in the way of family? Has the job, career, a hobby, or even other relationship become a problem for us? Has a friendship grown codependent? Do we need to set better boundaries? Whom do we value most? Others? or family. Now, I can't speak for you and how you manage uh, these issues, but I can give my testimony, good and bad, uh, from which you can draw some parallels and maybe learn a little something about ministry, too. When I began in ministry 37 years ago, taking a day off was not widely recognized for United Methodist pastors here in Eastern Pennsylvania. And that's because our bishop at the time instructed us to work 80 hours a week, no kidding, as he had done when pastoring his churches. He made it clear that if we wanted time with our spouses, we were to take them with us on hospital calls, something that he did with his wife when his parishioners were ill, which I have to say, God bless the bishop's wife because I don't know many pastors' spouses who consider a sick call at the hospital and, ca and coffee at the cafeteria there to be substitute for a dinner and a movie. And then what if you have children, right? What, leave them in the, in the waiting room? I, I don't know. But at the time, I was really and continue to be thankful to have served with a senior pastor at my first appointment who had three children and made it a point to be a husband and a father as well as a pastor. He took his ordination vows, yes, but he took marriage vows too, and he really didn't forget either one. He made ministry then much easier for me and my new wife, Deb, at the time, because he established a pattern that the congregation came to appreciate and respect. And because he took care of himself and his family, the congregation got a better pastor in him. But when my appointment at Morrisville ended and I moved, the blue-collar parishioners at Harriman Church in Bristol, Bucks County, held a different, more traditional perspective on the pastor's work schedule. A day off did not sit well with them, even though my predecessor there, a husband and father of three little ones, burned out after only two and a half years serving. What does that tell you? One woman loudly complained about this thing called a day off. And so I asked her, well, does the Bible apply to pastors? Well, of course, she indignantly replied. Well, then shouldn't I have a Sabbath rest as the fourth commandment dictates, right? I mean, I can't take Sundays, so Fridays are my day. And thinking of the apostle St. Paul's instructions to Timothy, how, how can a pastor be a husband of one wife and care for my marriage and family, and I'm always working. So there's a standard for all Christians, and there's a standard for pastors, which, you know, raises that bar slightly for us. Maintaining biblical standards, though, isn't always easy. That's just not a pastor thing. We all know that. I mean, family life can be tricky. In the 1990s, clergy divorced more than the average couple. Most recent statistics from 2015, however, report that only 10% of Protestant clergy now divorce, compared to 27% of all adults in the population. So we're moving in the right direction. Without making light of these difficult situations, one person astutely observed to me, you know, when the pastor, when the plumber has an affair or gets divorced, it's one thing. 
When that happens with a pastor, point taken. But it's not just the pastor and spouse who can experience difficulties. When the children of pastors grow up, one third leave the church. That's a figure which the researchers believe is a little low because it relies on pastors self-reporting. And a lot of pastors are pretty ashamed of, of how their family life has turned out. And so the numbers are probably a little low, a little more than 33 or 34%. There was a day when clergy were the best insurance, or really one of the best insurance bargains in the industry. We didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't gamble. We had actually signed a pledge here in Eastern Pennsylvania that, that, that we didn't do those things. And we seemingly lived as long as Methuselah, you know, 969 years, not quite, but close to it. Some denominations found insuring pastors so lucrative that they began their own insurance companies, like Lutheran Brotherhood. None of us remember that group. Today, though, clergy are rather expensive to uh, insure. Our rates of cardiovascular disease and cancer have been above the national averages. We're no longer among the top 10 safest occupations. But it's not just our health that's declining. So is our safety. 15 years ago, so many clergy were being shot in England that the Anglican Church actually issued a directive for their vicars to wear the cleric's collar only when, quote, on duty, unquote. That dangerous. A few years before that, long before our nation's current surge in violence, I've personally known the United Methodist colleague whose life was violently threatened by drug gangs and forced to leave, forced to move, one who was beaten and left for dead in the trunk of his car, both of those here in eastern Pennsylvania, and one in suburbia who was shot by a parishioner and lived. We don't hear those stories, do we? Nowadays, according to Christian organizations like the Barna Group, Lifeway Research, and others, it's politics and COVID and politics related to COVID that are the problems for pastors and our congregations. Matter of fact, that's such a large subject, I don't even have time to get into it here without lengthening the sermon well beyond what you're accustomed to. So I'm going to present it during the faith formation hour upstairs. If you'd like to get a cup of coffee and come on up uh, to the Z Lounge, you're welcome to do that. But all of this on top of the usual stuff that, that affects clergy, our families, and our churches. Over the years, one of the things that I most listened to was the many pastors, elder colleagues of mine, who told me that their biggest regret was giving others more time than they gave their own families. They celebrated congregants' joys, but missed their own family celebrations. They were not at their children's athletic events and concerts and scouting banquets and tucking them in to bed because of late night meetings. Do that long enough without a healthy work-home balance and no wonder preacher's kids leave the church. Now, let me be clear on this. I am not blaming congregations, not at all. Pastors need to take responsibility for ourselves and our families. Abram and Lot didn't blame others. Although in many ways, we're no different than other occupations, we are different in the sense that pastors really need to practice what we preach about family and, and do so with integrity. We need to set healthy boundaries like Abram and Lot. Because frankly, parish ministry can be overwhelming at times and a hurting pastor often leads to a hurting congregation, a hurting church because we're in ministry together. So talking about these worrisome things is helpful. Burden sharing is what Christians do with one another. And so the understanding and support of church leaders and church personnel teams are really necessary. Thank you, SPRC, uh, for that caring 
and holding clergy accountable to our shared values. And for me, being in a monthly peer group of clergy supervised by a licensed clinical psychologist is a long time part of my practice of ministry. It saved me from making some really regrettable mistakes as a husband, a father, a son, a brother, even a pastor. It keeps me sane, it keeps me accountable. So yes, you can tell your friends that your pastor's been in therapy over for over three decades and that will explain a lot and I get it, right? But to serve well for me means that I limit my church talk at home. Deb does not know your private lives. A lot of people, when they talk to her, just start up with a conversation thinking that she knows these things, and she doesn't. I take a weekly day off, especially from emails. Wait. I take off the occasional Sunday. I don't give out my cell phone number to everyone. I heed my family when they sense that I'm, as they say, over-functioning at church and not functioning enough at home. Because while the Roman Catholics call their clergy father, only Kira and Krista call me that name. As the statistics reveal, too many clergy and congregations don't realize their losses until it's too late. Abram and Lot realized what was happening, and all of us can learn from them. They confronted matters in healthy ways. They quite literally set clear physical boundaries, which ended up being good emotional boundaries to resolve the concerns and maintain health in their business and their family. I mean, clergy have a calling to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes that means that we need a savior. It never means that we need to be the savior. That job's taken. Thank you, Jesus. I love my Lord. I love my family. I love you, my parish, and I love my calling as a pastor. So that said, I have one request of you. Keep me and your pastors and staff in your daily prayers. That is one of the greatest and simplest gifts that you can give to us and really to the entire parish and in a sense to yourself. I'll be talking about praying for family in my next sermon from Genesis. Abram and Lot then set boundaries for all of us to emulate in our families and in our work. St. Paul defined how to live those boundaries when overseeing a congregation. The Bible establishes good, healthy boundaries which help in loving God, in loving family, and in loving this extended family of Christ called the church. It's best when pastors and disciples can say together, let it begin with me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let us share the peace of Christ with each other. Dear Lord, we put our love into practice. These gifts we offer came from your love for us. Now let us express our love for you as they reach out to others with your love for them. Let us pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now please join me in reciting the open road prayer together. God, may your preferred will break through, change history, usher in and accomplish through us your new hopes, dreams, and possibilities, both in the life of our church and in our lives. We surrender our wills for yours in order to fully follow you. Amen. From this place today, as well as when you leave home and family daily, go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. And help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord. Re rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.